Hello, everyone. Um, today, I have a very good friend. We are connected on Facebook for more than two years, if I'm not wrong. And hi, Deborah. How are you? I'm well. Nice to meet you in person. Yes. How are you I'm doing? So, uh, we are doing very well. It's cold in winter time, but I'm sure you guys are experiencing the same weather. So. Nice to meet you again. Tell us about yourself. So uh, my name is Deborah Watson and my husband and I live in Branson, Missouri. So we're like right in the middle of the heartland of America. Um, we used to be international missionaries for 12 years where we mentored teenage girls. And in 2006, um, I felt like the Lord was shifting me from doing a lot of traveling and doing stage productions to um, doing film. And so when we moved to Branson, I started the education process of learning the business side of the industry, because as I'm sure you know, it's definitely a very big industry with a lot going on. <laughs> in it. And to know the right path to walk and where to go, um, education is definitely a key part of it. So, um, I spent about 10 years educating myself and really honing in on my craft of writing. Um, I took Jerry Jenkins. Um, he's the author of the Left Behind series. Um, he has a Christian writers mentorship program that's a two-year program that I was able to be a part of. And so we started our film production company, Studio 222 Films. It's based on James 222, where his, it says that his faith and actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And part of that package is the Branson International Film Festival that we have coming up in April. And I just did a little check because I've got so much going on, I wasn't sure. But Hannah, did you know all three of your submissions were selected in the yes. script? <laughs> I'm Thank you. Yes. Congratulations so on your uh, all the film program, festival arrangement. I keep um, looking at your prayer network and also see whatever God is using you for that. So congratulations for all that, what you have achieved. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the Hollywood Prayer Network was started um, by Karen Covell out in Los Angeles many years ago. And I actually teamed up with them in 2001 to be one of the prayer warriors um, that they partner with people in the industry. And in 2013, I felt like I, there was just like that pulling that I wasn't doing my full part of being a part of their organization. And so I reached out to Karen and asked her, and she said, you know, it's interesting because our Missouri state representative is in St. Louis. And she was feeling like she needed to step down, but didn't know how to. And it made it easy for her to step down because she knew I was there to step into that space. And we're getting ready to travel because there's also a new um, Missouri State representative besides myself, um, Jana is in St. Louis. And so when my husband and I start traveling, I have the honor of being able to travel and pray with all the Hollywood Prayer Network leaders across the nation. And my heart's so humbled that Karen would ask me to do that. So a very great organization for people to get plugged in with. Yeah. Thank you so much for connecting me as well to them. <laughs> Thank you for uh, referring <laughs> That was a good place. I attend almost every Friday, but sometimes I cannot because I have either my some appointment, either I'm driving, bringing back home my daughter or whatever. So, but I still turn it on. Even I'm in the car, I just listen. I may not be participating, praying with them, but I do listen what they're praying. That's awesome. Good. And okay, so now, with your journey, whatever God has been doing in your life, tell people what are you doing now or, or what your mission and vision is now for future or for newcomers? <laughs> well, that's kind of a big picture. Um, so right now we're working on, our studio is working on our first full feature that Kevin Sorbo is going to be directing called Not Too Far From Here. Mm -hmm. And it dealing with, um, we all go through some kind of a trauma in life. 
Um, and sometimes we don't know how to cope with it afterwards. And so we're doing it through the eyes of a teenage Christian girl. Um, and she witnessed her mother kill her father in self-defense when she was three years old and had, um, since her mom was um, going to jail for that, because in the United States, many of our states, even though she was defending herself, she still took a human being's life and it's a mandatory 15 years um, minimum sentence in um, most of the United States. And so her mom is sent away to prison. Her dad is gone. There's no family to take her in. So she's adopted into a family. Um, and really that's such a model of how the church should be, um, whether it's in that kind of a relationship or like with your projects that you're working on, we can kind of adopt you into the family, so to say, of filmmakers to help rise you up and, and see your work come to fruition and grow and do what it was created to be. So that's um, kind of what we're doing with the film production company as well as the film festival, because my heartbeat is to really help others grow and um, do what God called them to do. And that's why he created, um, I have different platforms within our organization. And that's one of the platforms we have is to really help um, bring people together that can help other filmmakers grow. Um, I wish I could help everybody, um, but I can't, but the Lord knows who I can. And so we, we just take it one day at a time and see what he does. So that's interesting. And, you know, I always pray that God, let me learn to leave a legacy for my future generation. I don't know when I will leave. I don't know what is my life. I don't know what will happen, but I need God to know that I'm there and I'm available to do this. And I always say, I need to leave my legacy. I, I have to do that. So same thing, I pray for others that somebody can give me their legacy so I can carry on with that as well. So I'm praying for that too. Tell us something about your stories, um, maybe your some experience with the persecuted church or anything on your heart about persecuted church. You know, it's it's a very interesting dynamic because the word persecuted, like how my brain imagines it, I don't have any comprehension of what it truly means to be persecuted, except for maybe when I was a child and bullied by some kids, but. Um, as some of the people like to say, Deborah, you have white privilege. You have no clue what it's like. Well, I was beat up before by white older boys and it was a black man that interceded for me. And so for me, that's like my, I grew up in a very protected state, but when my husband and I were able to travel internationally, we started seeing things a little differently, like places that we went to that were third world countries that really truly are persecuted for their belief systems, we don't have a clue, right? In fact, one of the opportunities I had um, to partner up with a lady through um, Kickstarter, um, she was doing a campaign, it was called Gaza Girls. And she was originally, um, she's from New York, she's a photojournalist, and she was raised or born in Israel, and at, she became a refugee here in the United States when she was a child um, because her mom and dad wanted to protect her. They didn't want her to be part of the persecution that they were accustomed to. And so she decided she wanted to go back to Gaza, that one place that she used to call home that she still remembered remnants of her childhood there. And she expected to go back, Hannah, and find a broken, hollow shell of a community and when she went back there, she found young girls and young women that were trying to rebuild the streets. She found girls just sitting there painting each other's nails to look pretty for that moment. And all around them were devastation. There was three, a picture of three women that were trying to reopen their hair salon that had been bombed out and they were sweeping it out. And so it showed the heartbeat of humanity saying, okay, we just went through hell literally like literally hell on earth and we're still alive and we're still here. So we can either sit in the corner and cry and be, oh, woe is me or run away from the situation, but they didn't. Their fight that they had within them 
manifested itself in the work of rebuilding and restoring. And when she shared these pictures in the book called Gaza Girls, my heart just broke open because there's so many people, you know this very well, what the persecuted church looks like out there. And yet there's that passion and that fire and that desire to honor God with your life that you don't allow those circumstances to dictate your future. And so that's one of the things I love hearing people's stories. Even right now, we're praying and believing for some Afghanistan refugees that are trying to get to France. Um, we have no clue. We don't have a clue. And it, it breaks my heart because honestly, Hannah, some people in the United States are very much against immigration here. And I understand why, but they don't know their stories. I don't know their stories, but I feel like there are more people coming to the United States that are broken and wounded and they don't need to run into anger and hostility. They need to run into empathy, compassion, and the love of Christ. And we have that within us if we choose to utilize it, but too many are keeping it for themselves because they're scared to give it away and we can't live in fear anymore. We need to embrace those that are coming here and welcome them here um, because, I mean, if you stop and think about it, they literally just lost everything that was familiar to them. And now all of a sudden they're in a new place in a new space. They don't, they, they left war. They don't need to come and fit and face anger and hostility again. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a burden on my heart because I see it. I experience it. I walk into it and walk through it with others. Um, and I'm so thankful that we're alive today to be able to be a voice for those who have no voice. What would you like to say to the persecuted church as a Christian believers, as a church, what is our role to stand with the body of Christ? Because many Christians are persecuted in Pakistan, India, Africa, China, many other places. As, as we who are saved, we are in good place. We have everything. We have life. That's the most important thing. We are alive. What, what would be your um, message to the body of Christ? Don't stop praying. And I'm going to give a testimony from our church in St. Louis called Twin Rivers. Um, we were part of the World Missions Board there. And every year we had missionaries come to our church and share their stories. Gosh, you're going to get me all emotional, Hannah. <laughs> there was one. <laughs> That's okay. Um, well, one story of a gentleman, he needed to go to the city to get medicine for the clinic he worked at. And he knew it was dangerous. He knew he had to travel alone at night to avoid the robbers. And he knew that um, he had to make the journey that weekend. And so he left and went to the city and he just prayed the whole time. And he's like, Lord, please don't leave me alone. You know, I got to get, I got to get this medicine to help heal these people, please, please, please. And he could sense that there was evil around him. He went to the city and he had to stay all night on the way back home and he slept so sound it scared him. But when he got back to the clinic in the morning, there were some men there waiting for them and they were fearful. And the leader explained to him that they were bandits and they were following him. And they were planning on robbing him of the medicine, the money, and taking his life. And mm -hmm. at night when he fell asleep, that was their plan to ambush him at that time. But there was these 12 giants that stood around him. And they said, who were those men? And he said, you guys, I have no idea who they were. They must have been angels from God because I didn't see them. I didn't know they were there. And a man at the church stood up and he said, what was the date of that? And he told him, he said, I had an overwhelming sense to pray for you at three o'clock in the morning. And I called my armor bearers and woke them up and asked them to pray and intercede for you. Gentlemen, would you please stand up? 12 men stood up, Hannah. Wow. 
That's a great story. That's the power of prayer. And that's the power of interceding for somebody. And it's not easy to getting up at that time. Three, four o'clock is the time when you have a very good sound sleep of the day of the night. And that is the time when God wants you to be up and pray for somebody and praying for somebody means you're leaving your sleep you're leaving your comfort zone you're leaving your own um health sometimes you're not well or whatever or you didn't sleep on time but you are there to pray because god has chosen you to pray for somebody that's what i did for five six years for uh persecuted church in pakistan the dream god showed me for that's what i've been doing all this year so and that's it's really and that's why it's so important for people to rally alongside of you for what they can do, you know, because Hannah, if it's, if it's one dream, somebody else's has, has that too, you know, and if they don't see your story, like when they see your story, they're going to be like, oh, that's what that meant when it happened to them. And it will encourage and build them up. So when, when an army of believers gathers together with you and helps you tell your story, it has a ripple effect that goes not just through the airwaves, through the film and the media, but the airways that we can't see that are all around us, just like that night, you know? So you definitely are leaving a legacy behind, um, <laughs> but you're also leaving a legacy right now. Yeah, trying my best, whatever I can. And thank God, God has provided uh, many people around the world and a lot of awards on my wall with all those um, 22 awards for Hannah's dream till today. And I hope this year we'll get more awards. <laughs> so we're in pre-production, God's grace. And looking for a lot of actors, actresses, production company, partners, sponsors, donors, everybody I'm praying about. And people are coming, they're helping. There are a lot of volunteers who have been involved, passionately working from last year till today. So I'm honored and I'm thankful to all those people who have been taking out their time, their efforts, their talents, Everything has been used very, very dedicatedly for this project. Well, we look forward to seeing the day when it premieres, that's for sure. Yeah, maybe next year, 2023, September 19, or maybe 22nd. That's the date we have kept for the uh, release and the distribution. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Thank you so much for taking out your time. It was an honor to hear the true stories. We have to bring those true stories out and people should hear what's going on and how God is using his angels for the purpose of his kingdom. And of course, as you said, it's our responsibility to stand and pray for those who God wants us to pray for. So tell us something in the end, what is the uh, award ceremony going to look like and how it's going to be? Oh, the award ceremony at the film festival. So we're working on something. In fact, I just got off a call with our developer virtually where we're hoping to be able to have it where everybody across around the world will be able to come onto a virtual platform and participate in the award ceremony at that time. Um, it's an opportunity for us because we get so many great stories um, to be able to offer out the laurels. And for those of you that don't know how important laurels are, just like how Hannah said, she has 22 wins right now. When she gets ready to go to distribution after the film has been produced, she's able to put those certificates in her portfolio and let them see the amount of um, impact she's had before the film has even been made. And that helps increase um, her ability to um, negotiate at the table. Um, because if she only has one or two laurels or like, uh, and she submitted to maybe 30 film festivals, then they won't pay, pay very much attention. But if she has 22, wins on her like she has on her wall 
and she submitted to maybe 25 festivals, that's going to cause them to stay and talk with her longer. So just, um, I'm just honored to see what our judges um, said about your script and what's going to happen with it, um, with all three of them, because there's, there's a lot of really good scripts this year. And I know the judges had a hard time filtering through them. Um, so now me and my um, board of directors have the opportunity to go through and narrow it down to the top three out of 21. And, and it's a challenge. Yeah. Really is, but God knows who's, who's is this time and this season. And so um, we'll be making the big announcement. April 23rd is when the award ceremony is. So, yeah, excited to meet if God's will. And if all this COVID chaos is finished, traveling is easy to USA because for us, it's a lot of uh, protocols while we are traveling in USA or coming back. It's a big, big process and a lot of money involved in that. So I'm praying if it's God's will, I really want to come. I really want to meet all of you personally. And no matter whether I win or not, that's not the intentions to meet. But I just want to be in the presence of um, more spiritual people, more godly people, get connected, pray and spend time and learn from all of you. Because that's what I'm trying to do, learning more and more from everybody. I'm just in the learning phase. <laughs> well, we're honored to have you there. And if you can't make it physically, we're really hoping this platform that we're building out in the virtual world will make it even more interactive than just meeting in the Zoom room. So, yeah, yeah. Tell us something about Hannah's dream. Sorry, I forgot to ask you before or, or other scripts which I have submitted, how, how you think or what you think about those stories. So, I'm, to I'm torn because you have three very powerful stories. Oh my God. And, <laughs> More my personal, to judges. <laughs> yes. My personal favorite is Courageous. I really liked Courageous. Okay. Um, with Hannah's Dream, I had, so I read it when you first submitted it. So let me go back. Um, I think the thing with, with your dream is the fact that you knew something was about to happen, right? I mean, that's what the dream was. And so many people, have prophetic dreams and they don't know what they are. Right. Right. And I feel like if once Hannah's dream gets out there, people start not seeing the mysticism of Christianity, but the reality that God speaks to us and prepares us for something that's happening. I'll use an example. Um, my husband and I are getting ready to travel. Yellowstone is one of the places we want to travel and we were, he was talking about the active volcanoes that are there mm. and they just had the volcano that happened in Tonga and on Friday, which is way out by Fiji, which um, our heart is there for one of the missionaries there. And they were talking um, here in Branson, Missouri, how the shock waves in the air are, it's called storm dar and they pay attention to the weather around here. They actually picked up on our radar here 26 hours later that aftershock from that volcano explosion. So it makes me think about those ripple effects. And so now I'm not so surprised if something happens with a volcano because of the research that Mike and I did. And it all came because God inspired him at that moment. Pay attention to the volcanoes. The earth is crying out right now, right? So with Hannah's dream, I feel like the way it's going to be told and shown is not so much to glorify what happened, but how God communicates with his people. And why would we want to not have a relationship with a savior that is that intimately involved with us that would forewarn us before something like that happened? Now, in all fairness, you, you know this, your audience does not. But I'm sitting here saying that four weeks after we got rear-ended in a car accident and we didn't even see it coming. So there are times when things do happen that are not good, um, that we don't foresee. But there's a reason why, just like that man that prayed 
you know, in the middle of the night, just like you woke up from your dream, you know, and you didn't let go of that. You've held on to it all these years because you know when it's God's time, it's going to get released into the airways for the next generation to know mm -hmm. and understand. But I feel like with your, with your dream, Hannah, you lived it. You went through that. And people that don't live in that culture don't understand. Mm -hmm. I feel like you've written the story in a way that they'll understand. And maybe they won't be so cold hearted anymore. Maybe they'll start to understand, well, these are broken, hurting people, wounded people that need healing. And we have the freedom and the gift to heal them um, by supporting this story that tells the truth of, of what happens and how God saves and restores others. So the persecuted church is always going to happen until Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of it, the church doesn't have to feel persecuted but understand the suffering of Christ and his grace that happened at the cross because of it. And um, I feel that grace in that story. What we tried um, when we were writing, we want to, again, as I mentioned before, we are trying to bring the legacy. I may not be lived for a hundred years. I don't know how many years I will live. I don't know. So whatever years I'm living, uh, first I'm telling my daughter, what is her culture, what is her society, and then what I've been through, or my people have been through. So all that thing, I need to leave it behind. And I'm not from film industry. I've never wrote any stories. I have never studied English. I've never been to any college, university to learn uh, filming. This is all God's thing. I think I need to change the name of Hannah's dream. It's God's dream, not Hannah's dream anymore, because he wanted persecuted church because it's bride. His bride is being persecuted and he wants somebody to pray for them. Many films I've seen, they talk many other areas, but nobody's talking about persecution. So maybe, I don't know, Maybe that is what God wants the stream and then taking from here, taking to another level. I don't know anything when this was happening or I was praying until now. Now I know. Oh, so this is a movie. OK, I knew. OK, this is going like a feature. for. Oh, OK. Every day I'm surprised with something God is doing. And I said, oh, I can do that. This is what this <laughs> And somebody tells me, yeah, this is going to be like this. And I said, oh, wow. So every time my word is wow, I cannot say anything else to people. And I'm honored. God used me. I'm honored. God blessed me with this dream. It was hard to see when I was present in the dream. I touched everybody, I felt everybody, I heard those voices and noise. And I, even today, when I think about it, I can feel that dream, that thing happened. I was not there, but I was phys emotionally and spiritually was available there. So when mm -hmm. I now talk to the victims, before I say something, they tell, oh, this is exactly happened. How do you know that? So then I tell them my dream. I said, this is what I saw. This is what where I was. I can tell them the doors, the knobs, the windows, the faces, every single thing I saw. So for me, it's, it's just like my baby for all these years. So I'm very attached to it. And I really want to make this movie. And if you know, if anybody's listening, they can help. Please, please, please come and help us to make this movie. I know a couple of people in Vancouver that would be a good connection, I think. Um, if it's not them that helps you with it, they know people in the industry up there. Um, they're in the secular industry, but they know how to frame things together correctly um so they would be good employees to be on the project so just please. keep receiving and we'll see what happens please i would love to meet and talk if they can help in any way in any shape i'm open to discuss meet and then if from it's from god then yes i'm there to listen and if they say do this do that i will do it Please help awesome. me connect with some people if you can. 
They're actually, the irony of it is um, she's a teenager and I met her through the film festival. And every year she goes to a um, camp for the summer, specifically for film. And so she's connected to a lot of people in the industry there in Vancouver. So I'll get those connections for you. Please. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you for taking out your time and sharing the stories. It was an honor to meet you. That's great. Today we made it. Yes. <laughs> you take that care was. and God bless you. We'll meet soon, maybe in April on the festival. <laughs> yes. If not, you know, God's timing is always perfect. Yeah, we will. Thank you so much once again. Bye. God bless you. Bye.